Here we are with Robert Weisgräber and his talk, We Are Doing It Wrong, Dealing with Project Management. I'm absolutely happy to introduce him because yesterday we discovered that we met like 10 years ago <laughs> at an event uh, that compared three open source uh, content management systems that was in, back in 2004. It was Typo3 and OpenCMS and Plone. And all of you guys know what happened to those content management systems. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Robert Weisgräber. Yeah, good evening. Where, where, where is this applause? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, good evening. I think you can come to the front because the font is very small. But um, also I have like 70 slides, so I would take like two hours or something. Um, so I'll just talk and you leave the room if you don't want to hear me anymore. Um, who am I? My name is Robert Weisgerber. I'm working at uh, Exea. Um, I'm kind of a project manager. I started out with all these plans and gun charts and now doing more projects with the uh, post-it style stuff and uh, drinking coffee. And uh, I'm also a member of the Open PM community. Uh, uh, well, like kind of a type of three for project management. Uh, it's not a tool, but a knowledge database. And I'm also organizer of the project management camp in uh, Stuttgart. Um, I will be the, uh, in May 2015 for the third time then. And I'm also inviting you to join us in, in Dornbirn uh, in the end of November uh, for the project management camp in Dornbirn. What we do at XAR, we do stuff like this. This is uh, text in the web, and this is, has not been written by human. Uh, this is generated text. It's written from data, and because it's written from data, it scales very well. We have no problem generating 10,000 or 100,000 text like this, and we also do it in uh, nine languages. So that's what we do. It's kind of a technology software, a technology company. And if you want to contact me and follow me, uh, it's probably best following me on Twitter. Um, you might want to mute that food coma hashtag if you don't like food, because I'm, I really like food and I like taking photos of my food and posting that. And some of you, especially if you have, have uh, seen me last year, um, I'm a big fan of uh, no estimates or more like doing stuff which does not look possible at the first look. And, uh, but if you look into it, uh, it might actually be good. Yeah, and that's how I came to t um, talking about we are doing it wrong. It's not a, like a talk where you know what you're expecting. Uh, I just have like some ideas which I want to put in the room and uh, maybe you want to try them at home, right? Uh, but what does it mean? Um, Talk, we'll, I will have some aspects of project management uh, in software. So the it is actually, maybe it's a big IT thing. Uh, wrong is, I mean, yes, actually, I think we are doing it really, really wrong. We are not focusing on the right stuff. And we does, mean, does not mean developers. It does not mean agencies or uh, development shops. It does not mean clients. It means uh, all of us. In my opinion, Clients, agencies, development shops, and developers, and project managers, and me included, we are uh, just doing the wrong stuff most of the time. Yeah, that's the talk. Uh, yeah, and maybe you get some ideas. Um, first of all, why do we need to change something? Um, this is a slide that shows technology adoption rate. So what you have is uh, technology trends like the dishwasher, and adoption from 10 to 90% in the US. And if you go like the beginning of the last century, uh, the adoption rate was very, very slow. Uh, the dishwasher actually took like 40 years. And if you go for current technology trends, you see for each trend it gets faster. It's actually stellar. The tablet is the newest trend on that chart. It's like exploding. The trend takes two years. So we need to get faster, and, and we, don't, uh, we can't depend on selecting one trend and uh, profit, getting profit on that for, for like a long term. Because if you, I mean, if you invested in dishwashers, you had like a 40 years business model. That's cool. 
But if your business depends on tablets, you probably have a three-year business model, and then you have to select something new, because the life cycle of the technology itself is going down. So we need to get faster. And we need to be more adaptable with what we do in our company, what we produce, uh, how we get what market we do, what technology we use, what technology we, we, we serve as, because I mean, we're selling something at some point. And if you look at the, at the industry, this is a chart from, from Maersk, the, the big uh, logistics, and uh, uh, you probably know them from the big logo on the ships. Uh, this is a chart showing a cycle time for software or ideas. So basically, how long it takes for an idea to be launched into a software product. And in 2010, they had a median cycle time of 373 days. So it takes them normally one year, more than one year, to execute on an idea they had, which they decided on this is a good idea. So if you actually, and they have like, 20% of the requirements actually took more than two years. And this is too long, because I mean, if, you're, if your technology trend, a global trend is only two, three, four, five years, and you will take two years to introduce a new software or technology, that's too long. So, and the second thing is, or the third thing is, software plays more, a bigger, bigger role in every software. We don't have a separation of IT and business. That's just fiction. If you're an insurance provider, what, what's your business? Your business is the software that's running. Because you don't have anything else which, which makes a difference. Uh, even Maersk, as a logistics shop, is a software company. Um, and we need, we need to be fast and adopt the megatrends, or adopt to what the market needs from us and do that. And then we can have software as a game changer. With, uh, Maersk actually started a, a big um, journey program to rethink how they do IT. And uh, they are now locked down to, I think, 70 days or something for an, ID, for an idea to, to uh, software. And it's now possible with one click to shop a container to your home. So, because it's like Amazon for big shipping containers. And that's a game changer because, I mean, if you try to ship something very, very big, uh, it's probably so much on formulas, forms to fill out, uh, you don't know what to do. Because now, if you really, really do good software, you are a technology company, and then you have a game changing with, compared to your industry. And that does include like every company. I mean, this is a, a tweet actually, but uh, from uh, Barry Christ, and the, the, even John Deere, the, the tractor maker, or Nordstrom, it's a big uh, retail thing. They they run on IT that makes that that drives their business. And the problem that we have is uh, we we would, we can't wait for the fourth industrial revolution, uh, right? Waiting for Industry 4.0. Um, like we did for the last three years, because there will be no fourth industrial revolution because it does not have a, a version number anymore. It's already there. It already has happened. So, IT is, your business is IT, and we need to get faster because we are actually very, very slow. If you think the normal website takes us like, I don't know, two months to launch for a simple website, a uh, larger portal I've been in in projects uh, of, which took over a year where the political situation for the market changed so much that uh, the, the software and the, the portal and the application we developed was actually not uh, useful anymore because the, nobody needed it because it was like two years delayed. <laughs> and of course, there are systems which are not mission critical. This is a website of a NASDAQ 500 company. <laughs> Looks good, huh? Um, yeah, probably. It's, it's probably not a mission critical system, but I think it would be hard to find uh, employees with that one. So, what we need to do is uh, we need to keep up. And that's why I think uh, we need to change how we do IT and IT business. I've now compiled like eight ideas, and so I'll just pitch it to you and 
I'll like, have a look at that and um, let's wrap it up in the end. Um, I think what we're doing is uh, we're using a lot of metaphors uh, because they look like good analogies and I think they're wrong. I mean, one of the most used metaphors you use for describing software is this one. It's like software is like building a house. We need a plan, we need a good foundation. Uh, we have to build the walls first, then we have to build the, to put the electricity in. Um, it's often used, I've used that myself, and I think it's wrong because, uh, well, actually, in software, you don't have to build a foundation first. And uh, if you decide from one day on the next that you, don't, you want to redo all the electricity works, you can do that, You're actually, because there are no physical limitations. So by comparing what we do to this one, um, we feel great if you produce a solution which looks like this, but actually we can do stuff like that. So what we need to do is to remove all the comparisons we do because they limit our thinking. And that's also the words we use, they limit what we do because it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy what we do. There are a lot of other metaphors and analogies that, that people use. I mean, the, the building a bridge thing, people have used that. Um, I've, I did it myself, is comparing software to art, artwork, and, and you have artists which are doing that. I don't think that's, that's right too because, well, various reasons. Um, but have a look at what metaphors you are using and what they describe and how they limit what you're actually doing. Then we have one that's actually mostly coming from the, the client side is uh, that we have extensive process governance. We have, a, we have a long process of what we do and the client says, okay, in the next year we want to do uh, these features for a website or for a portal. And uh, of course he wants predictive and reliable software releases and then we make kind of a, a, a backlog of features. And this is independent if, you, if you're doing agile or waterfall, it doesn't matter, but in the end it's like, okay, we want to do this and then you go to the agency and they say, okay, um, let's lo have a look at that, do a prioritization, um, make a contract because you as the agency or the, the development shop is it's in-house, I mean, you want to, to, uh, to guarantee your resource uh, utilization, you want to plan how many people do we need, how, do we, how we will pay the salary and stuff like that. So but basically what you're doing is, is risk aversion. That's fine, I mean, it, that's your interest, you have to do that. And then we have this linear process like, okay, first we, we start with the, the idea, then we make kind of a uh, wild ass estimate for that, then, then we, we'll have a, have a detailed look on that, and we make the investment decisions, uh, then we make a, a more concept out of that, and in the end then we program it, then we test it in-house, then we test it uh, in the client side, and we test it on our integration system, then we test it on system B, C, D, E, E, F, and then it's live at some point. Um, Anything familiar with this process? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's actually not, it, I don't think it's, it's a broken process, but we'll come later um, why this is really, really a big problem. And then we do that, we are optimizing on resource utilization. Um, well, resource means human at this point. Um, because we need to, do, we, we think we need to do some resource planning. So what we do, we take our backlog of orders and we say, okay, we, we want a, a long time commitment. Yeah, I mean, you have, you have your agency, you have like 20 people, or you have a development shop, and you say, okay, I, I want to know, will there be enough work in May? Will there be enough work in June? Will there be enough work in September? How, who pays for that? Um, let's have like a, a large backlog of orders from potential uh, clients. We we'll say, okay, you can please sign here and we start in, in somewhere in three or four months, something like that. Because you have committed salaries and, and then you have this resource planning process. Uh, so you take all the things that you might, that you think you have to do, uh, all your people and uh, you sit together and make some Excel charts and stuff like that. And these three together, or these two together, the question is, is there, is there actually a conflict of interest? If you have a look at what the, the client and the business wants, as we've seen before, we need that fast implementation thing, because fast 
reliable too, but it actually we, we have to realize our ideas and we have to, because we are a software company now. Um, of course, he has, if he's cost aware, that's fine. Um, but he also has one, one, one very big interest and that's actually the, the, the main one. He needs the right software solution and he needs to identify the right problem. So, because I mean, it doesn't, doesn't help if you have fast solutions, but you're not doing the real valuable stuff. And the development shop and the agency, I mean, they, they want to get paid. Uh, they probably want to uh, mitigate some of their risk. Well, that's understandable. Uh, they want some kind of mid and long-term commitment because, I mean, they have to pay uh, salaries and they might, so, okay, maybe uh, it's a takes two or three months to find a new developer, or five developer, or to create a new team if it's a big project. But uh, they don't start if they don't have that uh, commitment. And of course, you have the development team itself, the developers, project managers, and stuff like that. They want to build cool stuff. Uh, they, they want to work with experts. They want to have good colleagues. Uh, and of course, they want their job security and their salary. Um, now, but actually, I mean, these, these things uh, over here uh, have to be provided by the client, right? The client wants his fast implementation and he wants the right software and he needs the help of these guys on the right side. So what we actually want it would need is how do we align these interests overall? We'll start with the, the fast implementation thing uh, and the cost thing. Uh, this is just for a theoretical thing. Um, just to, to define the, the team, the, the term, the lead time is the time you need to get something done. That's the, the, what we saw on the Maersk chart. Um, from idea to uh, ticket life is called here. Where it's a solved software is delivering value. It's not production. Uh, so this, this time from here to here uh, is actually the lead time. And that's, that makes the difference for your business. You want to have that short. There's something called the Little's Law. Um, you can Google the theory. Uh, it's actually true. Uh, and it says throughput is work in progress over late time. So now we do a little bit of uh, mathematical magic. And we see, OK, we just identified that we need to get the lead time, uh, the lead time down because that's valuable. Uh, what do we do? It's easy, actually. I mean, if we, uh, if we reduce our work in progress, um, lead time goes down. Easy. And that's totally counterintuitive. Because if you're actually doing less, you're getting faster. So all of the, the stuff we did, with like this long commitment, this big backlog of orders and stuff like that, uh, actually it reduces our lead time. By, by keeping the throughput the same, of course, you can also increase the throughput, uh, just putting more people on it. I will also put the slide on, on, on Twitter after the thing is actually already online, I think. And, and there's another thing. Um, if you had the cycle time or lead time, um, if you look at resource utilization, uh, and as your resource utilization goes up, your cycle time does not go up linear but it actually increases exponentially when you're reaching the, uh, over here, 70, 80% and stuff like that. That's why firefighters are uh, like only 10% utilized because they need to be very, very fast. Yes? It's that cycle time is just a, an abstract big, uh, thing of lead time. You just, you could just, there's no real definition. It's both. It's, it's the same. The little law is the same for lead time and cycle time. But it doesn't help if you, um, if, this is, if this is fast, it does not help you. Because it's still, the, the, the relevant time is the whole chart, from the idea to how, when the idea is live. Everything which is between here and here is work in progress. Yeah. So I have to skip the animations. So, okay, as I said, because 
I mean, and the problem is that you, when, you, when you go for high resource utilization, because you say, okay, uh, we actually want all our uh, developers to be planned with features uh, and all resources uh, that, they, that they have enough to do, you're ending up here. Your lead time goes or cycle time goes up. And the question is, of course, uh, where's the money? The money is in reduced lease time. Because the, your reduced lead time um, is a value in itself. Um, it decreases your throughput. You can do more in the end if you look at the little, a little loss a bit, uh, little more. Um, you, as an agency, you get your faster money because it's finished faster. Um, this faster delivery of value is uh, very important for the client because the moment the feature is live, it's delivering a value on your platform. Uh, if you have a new contact form or a new uh, checkout process, uh, it's actually that is better than the old one, then you're making more money, right? And if it's faster, um, it's delivering that value earlier. And also, you can now test it, does it actually solve the problem? Because now we have the fast solution, but we actually don't know if it solved the right problem. Uh, it reduces risk. Because for the agency or the dev uh, development shop, you don't have like these big things which go through your organization, and, and we have to have a, a, a rigorous control over it and do controlling that it doesn't explode because it's already finished before you have a sharper look. And because you have these shorter feedback cycles overall, those include the cash flow. Um, you can go from planning to uh, prediction, because you now have data, you say, okay, in the last four months, um, for every two days, we have the cycle time for, say, for every ticket for four, four days, and they all made like 1,000 euros. So we can say, what will we make next week? And you don't have to do process, like uh, sitting together for doing an Excel chart for that. Uh, and, and the only thing we did is minimize work in progress, and that does not also, that, that's not only, if you look at the, the cycle time, that's not only doing less items or tickets at one time, but it also, if you just shorten your process, it also reduces your work in progress. If you have like 14 different steps in your uh, development process, from client having the idea, the estimation thing and stuff like that, if you go down to three, your progress, the stuff that in the system goes down, and that's also limiting your work in progress, uh, reducing your work in progress. And we are now focusing on flow instead of utilization. So you don't say, okay, I want, I want to know are all my developers uh, or are my resources uh, utilized for the next month, but you also, okay, we're actually going down with like four days per idea to life. Can we get faster? Is that fat in us? What, what, uh, what impediments did we have that we can't all go down to three days? And uh, we need a smaller batch size. That's, I'm coming to that uh, again later. Um, but it's actually, those, those, are, uh, those are very, very easy changes to make. And on the other hand, is now that uh, delivering fast as a value of itself, that's actually where you can get paid. If you think on the uh, client uh, dev shop conflict of interest. It's now in the interest of the client that his agency does not have a large resource utilization. So he do, should actually pay for the time where the developers are not working because for the free time uh, reduces his lead time, which is more valuable than the time he's just sitting there and producing stuff which takes too long. Just an idea. Okay, and the fourth thing, uh, it's called Hey Junka. Um, it's a term from, from lean development. Um, it's a, the problem is that we are using a non-adaptive technique, I'm coming to it later, but that means for non-standardized activities. Because the software we are doing is not standardized in its output. We know how we do it, that the process, the flow, that's standardized for what we do if we work together. But the thing itself is knowledge work, and it's not standardized. And we're all using this Hey Junka, this leveling method, 
like, okay, we fix here a little bit, and uh, okay, we have here free resources, we put them over here. Um, we don't use a, like a Kanban or pull system, but we use this um, overall leveling thing to identify the, the biggest problem and think we fix our system. Um, we'll see this graph again, as I said before. If you have a look at uh, what happens here, as I said, we want to reduce the work, the work in progress, so we can limit the number of tickets in there, and we could also um, have a look what's in here. That's all value chain, value chain for what we're doing. Yeah? I mean, you have the need on the left side and the light feature on the right side, and in between you are doing stuff. Yeah? Well, you're doing some analysis and requirements, and you're doing architecture, programming, testing, and you're doing your deployment. That's all value. That adds value to that uh, what you're doing. I mean, that's what software development is about. Yeah? That's good. And now you have all the other stuff on the other side. You have waiting times. Customer is not available. Yeah, you have a question during the analysis and requirements. Now you have like the ticket lying there, you're doing task switching, um, you're waiting, that does not add value. Um, then you need the business approval. That is not a valuable process. You're doing your estimating thing. It's not. It, the feature is not getting any more ready by that. Yeah, you're probably doing too much uh, architecture up front. Um, then you have to switch your developers to another project for a day because the, the, there it was actually sometimes late. And then uh, over the whole time, um, you didn't uh, have a look at the requirements uh, exactly or they were not known and you have to redo something. And because it all like took like 50 weeks, you have to do your integration again because actually the patch doesn't work anymore on the production system because other patches uh, are in conflict. And what you're now trying to do is, or you should try to do is, eliminate all these on the bottom because they are not what this is about. This is about writing software, and writing software is only the green part on the top. So we need to cut back, cut back on these easy things here. Idle tickets. Who has a ticket system? Who has this kind of flag, backlog, pool, whatever, where are like some four month old bugs and ideas are sitting? And who looks at those like every two or three months and sorts them again and again and looks if you can close something? Yeah, that's called an inventory. Uh, it doesn't add value. Just, I mean, just admit it that you won't do that bug and just delete the ticket. It doesn't help. Um, of course, if you committed on doing it and it sits around for four months, that's a problem too. And you have, uh, the second problem, it's uh, actually waiting time. Uh, it's waiting for somebody else. Oh, we don't have a tester ready. I've heard that from clients very, oh, we need, oh, for testing, we need like uh, eight weeks in, uh, before to know what he needs to test so that we can assign test resources. Oh, that's good. Perfect. So we have at least eight weeks for everything we do. That's cool. On the other hand, um, try to, to move uh, information and code very, very fast between all the people involved on the green side and link those people together that are doing stuff. Yeah? I mean, if, if testing and uh, software development is actually adding resources, is actually adding value because you need that, just put them together in one room and let them do it. And then you don't have the task switching idle time between waiting time and resource problem. Just put them together and you'll be faster. And remove all these linear sequences. I've seen uh, all these like, okay, uh, design has to approve, uh, marketing has to approve, our finance has to approve, and we always do that in a linear sequence. And why we don't we do it in parallel? We need the sign-off of three people, just let them sign off in, at the same time, they don't have to be linear. And the same for deployment or in your programming. It's called uh, one piece continuous flow. That's the, well, some would call it the, the, the Uber Kanban or something like that. <laughs> but it actually is something, it's, it's very similar to Kanban, but it's actually something like ELF. Citrix did it um, on the enterprise level for their portfolio thing. 
portfolio management program. And they came down from 42 month cycle time to 10 month cycle time. And of course, if you're sitting together, let's try one of these, let's try mob programming. That's all people sitting in one room with one computer. Five developers working on one keyboard. It's actually very, very funny. Uh, looks very, very good and it's extremely efficient. It's totally counterintuitive to have five people, but in the end, you're getting the right code and nothing more, and it works. There's a nice video on that when you, when you Google it. Uh, where there's a time-lapse video of a day of mock programming. Yeah, and then we are doing another thing very, very wrong. We are using projects. Um, I'm a project manager. I'm allowed to say that projects are bad. Um, the problem is, in, projects have some intrinsic properties. It's a temporary organization to achieve a predefined result at a pre-specified time using predetermined results. That's actually the definition from, from the PRINCE2 um, project management guide. Um, and they, they are successful when they are on schedule, on budget, on time. Or on, on, on quality. And quality for us no, often, normally means it has all the features we need uh, because quality in software is a little bit of a problem. Um, but you don't look at the value here. The, the value of what it's delivering is not in here. I mean, um, if I deliver on schedule and on budget and the right features, but if I deliver the wrong thing, because we, all we did is, that's our assumption for the project model, is that we know what we want at the start. And these things here, that we predefine result, time, budget, and something like that, um, does actually devalue flexibility. Because everything that happens later and is not in part of the original plan or the original idea is per se considered bad. We call it change request. Yeah? I have to make a request to do something which I know would be better than the other thing. That's not good. That's uh, Alan Kelly. Uh, he's actually on Twitter with the no project hashtag. Um, he said, delivering scheduled budget features is a sign of failure, not of success. Because if you're doing a project, and after one year, you did exactly what you thought one year before, you did not learn anything. And that's just impossible. That's not good. And the problem with project is here that at the beginning of the project, um, we, we know the, the less amount of stuff about what we want to do, and, but the decisions we make have the highest impact. Like we, when, when we are we selecting architecture for our software, it's here, when we just know nothing about what we're doing. Because we're actually, it's a learning process. So I say, uh, project R, the software goes to die. And the problem is soft, successful software does not end. If you deliver your software and it's successful, your project has ended. Your team is gone, everything is gone, but actually your software is successful. Now you're starting to delivering the value, uh, you have the ideas what to do, you get your feature requests and stuff like that. So what we actually should do is we should look at software as a state, not a result. We don't, don't plan on like, okay, on the March the 24th, we are launching the platform and the project is ended there. But actually the point where the software starts is March 24th. That's the important day. Now we start doing stuff. So your teams should um, should be defined by that state. Don't, don't plan how do, do you're doing the project, plan how you're doing the successful software and how you test that. Um, if you want to Google it, it's uh, called service creation and service delivery. So treat everything, treat your software as a service for the company you're doing. Um, and don't limit yourself by doing predefined long-term domination of stuff uh, beforehand. And then we have another problem in uh, projects. Uh, who of you has worked with a project team? 
Oh, who of you has worked in or with a project team? Probably like everyone. Who of you had like a good project team with a fun working and you did good stuff and stuff like that? Okay, what happened when the project was, was ended? You destroyed that team. You sent all people back to the various organization. Um, okay, he's lucky. <laughs> but that's, that's how software is done. I mean, you get the resource uh, ABC and uh, Mr. Miller and Frau, uh, Frau Uber, and you put them together for the time of the project, and then you do all these uh, team building stuff and, and so, and then you have your successful project team, and uh, they're working together, and then it's over, and they're sent back. And then you're putting them together in the next different project in a different scenario. So people who have learned how to work together are getting destroyed again. You're destroying your team. Every time your, your project ends, you're destroying a successful team. So what you should do is bring work to the teams. Create some teams, stable teams. Um, Ideally, that would be like very, very close to the business, not in a separate organization or stuff like that. And then bring that work to that teams and treat those teams as queues. It's like, hey, we have four software development queues and I'm assigning you this works. And of course, they have a different kind of capacity and you have to manage that capacity. Um, but don't switch project and task between these queues. And I said before that we have a problem with batch size. And I, see I've, I think I have to speed up a little bit. Um, if you look at uh, the value distribution of, of requirements in a project, is your project is like a big box. And there's like lots of uh, requirements in there. They're here named 1 to 14. And if you look at them, they have partial value they bring to the whole project, like here the Number one has 12% and 13 has 21%. And they cost different amounts here. One costs 1%. And then you plot them like here, cost a value of a cost. What you can actually see is, uh, OK, number one would actually be a very, very good feature. I need very, very low cost for good value. And these here, they are, they are OK. And 11, 12, 14, 10, probably we should not do them. And that's one of the problems with, with projects is they come up as this big box. And you say it's it either go or no go for the whole project, but you should actually try to deliver features in your organization and not projects. Because you're limiting your options by saying, okay, we have to accept that everything comes in these big, big boxes instead of looking at actually we need these small features from here, and then we do from this uh, area of, of activity these four features, and this is the next most valuable feature. And then you, if you look at the, the smaller batches, you have a portfolio of option, options what you're doing, and you can select, and you can also do the identify where your value is probably non-linear for the whole project. Uh, there's a nice exercise, it's called Elephant Carpaccio, um, because it's coming from the idea that how would you eat an elephant? I mean, you would just put it in small slices and then eat it. Um, for doing that, for taking your whole project and, and delivering small, small, lots of slices from that. Yeah, we're actually very, very bad at decisions. Um, I will skip a lot of that. That's because it's boring, uh, boring, boring. This is interesting. Um, cost of delay. Cost of. <laughs> um, the the cost of delay is. It's not looking at the cost of the feature, but looking at what is behind a different end date. What does it mean? How does our here cost of what what would be the cost if the feature is delayed by a little bit? And then if you have a look at that, you will see that you have different kind of, of uh, profiles for that. Of course, you might, if you have a, uh, a non-working production environment, the cost is enormous. You have to fix it now. If you, if you like, wait like two days, you accumulate very, very, very high cost. Um, some features are like, well, actually, I mean, if it's later, then we don't have the new checkout process, so we lose probably we lose two, three percent. 
but actually, I mean, that's okay. And then some have a fixed date, like if you're doing uh, a banking stuff and you have the SEPA changes and you're not live uh, on a different, uh, on a certain date, um, that's important. But here, uh, you don't care. It's actually doesn't matter. Mad. So having a look at what your end dates are made out is, is interesting. The cost of delay thing is, is very good. And then, because if you talk about that, um, you're moving away from this one. Yeah, and then technical debt is a theme. Um, think about that if you next talk about technical debt. It's, it's not like the bank gives you a credit, credit line, but they actually want your money. Think about shell shock. I mean, if you have a bad deployment process and you're getting shell-shocked, uh, we had that last week, uh, it's, you can really, really see technical debt coming up. Yeah, and then one of the last things is uh, we are doing lots of things that are technically possible, but they are actually not good. Um, we have to look at what is done. Lots of teams who have a definition of done in his team. Yeah. Okay. Um, the only software that's done is software that's doing its job, right? On production. Everything else is, I don't care. I don't care about software which is like, oh, well, we are ready and we have documented it and it's ready. Well, it's actually, if it's not delivering its value, and that also means if it's, deliver if it's live, but it's not delivering its value because it's the wrong feature. It's actually not done too. Yeah, uh, skip these slides. Uh, okay, we'll talk, uh, would have talked a little bit of continuous delivery, but that's fine. Uh, I think we covered the main points. The point is we go back to the batch size again. If you go for a big project, you're starting to delivering value after a long time. You, if you go for small batches, you start accumulating the value very, very fast. Yeah, continuous delivery can be found online. So we're coming to a summary. I actually didn't have to skip so much. Um, try to do work with aligned interests. Trust yourself in working together, and that's client, agency, dev team, and make transparent what you actually want, and, and try to, as a client, try to make your mission the mission of the, the development shop or the agency. And of course, for the agency, I mean, you want to earn money, that's your business. So that's fine, don't hide it. And as a client, you have to accept it. That does not mean that you have to like pay amounts that are not like real. But payment is, I mean, that's what you're doing. And if you have your internal dev shop, you're paying too. It's the same. Uh, do valuable software. Um, and the meaningful software, value software that's a game changer, software that's changing, that's far better than getting 1%, 2% better or a return on invest on like four months or stuff like that. Don't be limited by f physical limitations because you don't have that physical limitations with software. Yeah, and deliver early in small batches and continuously and uh, try to make your assumption that you're doing provable and test it on production. And for your team and the stuff they do, focus and flow on focus on the state of the service that you created, of the team state, of the ticket throughput stake. Think about your velocity of your, and your flexibility and don't limit your options. Thank you. I bet there are a lot of questions right now, but unfortunately we don't have to wait for them. <laughs> 